Hi, everyone. Thank you for attending. Uh, this is the 11 o'clock session in our uh, After the Harvest, uh, Preservation Access and Researcher Services of the 2016 End of Term Web, Arch uh, web Archive. So we'll talk about what that is, and uh, we'll kick it off. And we have plenty of time for questions and discussion at the end. So there's been a good bit of attention about the preservation of government uh, and presidential uh, web content uh, due to the transition and we'll talk about some of the issues around that <laughs> at the end and uh, and encourage folks to comment and feedback. All right, how's my navigation? Just that. Yep. That, okay. Okay. I guess All right. Want to introduce Hi, everybody. Uh, so I'm Abby Grotke from the Library of Congress and we have Jefferson Bailey from Internet Archive and Mark Phillips from University of North Texas Libraries. And we are three of the many partners, many, thousands of partners, no, that's an inside joke. <laughs> we have about uh, eight partners that we'll talk about, um, partner institutions helping build this archive. So we're gonna talk a little bit about the history of the archive um, and what we're doing now and also what our plans are for thinking about researcher access to the collections. So we like to say it began a long time ago, far, far away in Canberra <laughs> in 2006, I think, or 2008, okay. Um, and we were meeting of, uh, at the International Internet Preservation Consortium meetings uh, during that time. And we had just gotten the word that our colleagues at the National Archives, who are in the room, but <laughs> um, we're not going to do an end of term uh, .gov crawl of, or crawl of the .gov domain as they had done in 2004. So a number of us sitting around the table, we were already doing archiving of this nature, our own efforts in this area. Um, we just looked at each other and said, well, somebody's got to do it. So um, at that time, the Internet Archive, Library of Congress, California Digital Library, University of North Texas, government printing office at the time, now they're the government publishing office, um, gathered together to form the end of term archive. And at the time, we were all IIPC members. We were also all NDIP partner and DSA members as well. So we were already working together on a number of projects. This just seemed like a natural fit. So like I said, we were already doing a bit of government crawling our own. I won't go into all the details of this, but basically there's a lot of activity from a number of institutions around archiving.gov. Uh, we like to say the U.S. domain is not easily defined, neither is the .gov domain. So various organizations have taken different slices of it depending on their research interests and needs. Um, but by coming together, we could really build a community around this um, and expand our collections. Uh, so there were, again, also some other community efforts and, and more in recent years. There's something that we're a part of, the Federal Web Archiving Group. Um, there's other research projects and citizen projects to document .gov. So the goals were to, again, work collaboratively to preserve the government web, uh, document the federal agency's presence during a time of presidential transition, uh, and enhance our own research collections. Part of the piece of this is that we're all doing collecting, but then we bring the archive together and then make preservation copies and share it with partners. So there's more than one copy available of the archive. We also wanted to raise awareness, and we can talk a little bit more about uh, this year, raising the most awareness um, in terms of outreach and, and making people aware of the importance of preserving government information and web archiving. And we also wanted to use the data to engage with researchers who are involved in web archiving um, and other subject experts. So the distribution of work has changed uh, depending on the year. We started in 2008. Uh, we did another archive in 2012. Um, and again, we've gathered again for this end of term uh, transition project. So, over time, we've adjusted who's doing what and what pieces of the web we're all crawling, but you can get a sense of, of the things that need to be done. Um, mostly, we've been focused on collecting and preserving, but we are looking more at access and making things available, which Jefferson will talk about a little bit later. Um, but we all sort of pull together, collect content. Some of us work on the access side. Some of us work on coordinating volunteers um, that we'll talk about in a moment. Um, other people are extracting metadata, 
archiving social media, um, things like that. So we have a lot of funding. No, no, we have no funding for this project. <laughs> um, we have no grants that are currently supporting this activity. We're all sort of contributing our own institutional resources as a part of our own web archiving program. So we like to joke that, you know, <laughs> it would be nice if we had a lot of funding coming in, but actually there's only a handful of us really committing resources at our own institutions for this. It's not to mean we won't eventually get some funding for some aspects of it, um, and we can talk about that maybe in the Q&A. So defining the web presence has been one of the biggest challenges, and it, we started uh, with the 2008 archive with a few data sets. One was the crawl that NARA had done in 2004, so we had access to that list. We had a couple other uh, lists of, of seed URLs, which was the starting point for the crawler. Um, and we've, built, we've grown that list over the years. So we start with bulk lists of domains. There's not one big list that we can consult that has everything. So it's been a bit of a mishmash trying to find all the sources. It's gotten a little bit easier this time around. We have access to more um, from data.gov and usa.gov. And we actually, for the first time this year, have received a list of uh, URLs from Google, so they have provided a list of, um, is that how to articulate what they gave us? <laughs> yeah, a list of URLs of anything.gov that they were aware of. Um, so all of this together becomes a starting point, but then we also rely on other folks to help us identify specific things that are of concern to subject experts and uh, the community at large. So a big part of what we're doing is you know, we have this bulk list, but we also engage the community. We've done a really great job this year. We're really excited um, that we got some press in the New York Times a few weeks ago. One of our uh, partners, Debbie Rabina, who participated um, in 2012, she actually got a class of hers uh, at Pratt to identify social media content for us. Um, she gathered together a group of uh, subject experts in New York a couple weeks ago and also today, I think right now, <laughs> she's holding a second one. Um, we're also seeing other events uh, sprouting up that we really haven't done anything to create. So these are coming out of community interest in the project. Um, UPenn, UC Riverside, Toronto, uh, and then other organizations are holding little hackathons. So it's been really fun and exciting for us to see the community engage around the materials this year. Um, we also got some more press today, so we expect more interest. Uh, uh, there was an article in the Library Journal and also on Motherboard, a Vice publication today. So we're getting a lot of interest this year, uh, which we wish for the quieter times sometimes <laughs> that we didn't have as much attention on the project. But um, So the volunteer contributions we've had since the beginning, 2008, we had about 500 nominations um, from 26 nominators. Uh, 2012, that increased greatly, and then we've just updated our numbers. Um, so far, we expect this to increase as we get closer to the, the uh, inauguration. So we'll talk a little bit about the schedule later on. So government websites can be pretty much anything we've discovered in this project. We have .gov, that's an easy one. But there's also um, a lot on .com and .edu that we discovered in some of the earlier projects that, we really, that aren't really showing up on some of the lists that we have access to. So that's where um, it becomes really important that we have the community help us identify some of this content. Oh, Jefferson has good lingo for these slides, and I can't remember what it was. <laughs> we sometimes jump around who does the slides. <laughs> you want to jump in and say, <laughs> just they're invasive. <laughs> A web ephemerality, sorry. Um, some websites uh, we don't have access to, again, in the public list. They're not listed anywhere, so having users who are familiar with this content has been really important to help identify it. Um, there's certain content we can't archive in terms of uh, things behind passwords and logins and, and databases are a problem, and there's been a lot of interest this year particularly in that and in data sets. Um, there's just a lot. <laughs> There's a lot of government content, so trying to figure out what it is we need to be preserving during this time and trying to ensure that we are doing a good job um, is tricky. 
So the end of term archive, the 2008 and 2012 archives are available uh, through a portal that the California Digital Library is hosting. Internet Archive is hosting the, the archive content, but the CDL interface does the metadata and search and browse. Um, we recognize that this is probably a bit outdated and we need to do a little bit better. Our partner, our old partner, Tracy Seneca, is here and she helped us set this up, but that was a number of years ago. So particularly now that there's a lot more interest in this content and making it accessible to research use, we need to do a better job on, on the access end. Um, just to mention a couple of other efforts, we have a Twitter account that you can follow um, to see updates from the project and also there's been other papers published around the work that our volunteers have done, so it's really exciting to see and also think about what might come out of some of these data-thons or hackathons or nominate-a-thons, whatever we're calling them. Um, there's also a number of other efforts around this time that are related. The Internet Archive has done an election crowdsourced collection. Um, other institutions like the Library of Congress, is, we also archive campaign websites. It's separate from this archive, but it's sort of re all related. Um, and I hear the Internet Archive is also doing a, some work with the White House in terms of documenting the web and social media data um, as a part of the transition process. So I'm sure Jefferson can, can answer questions about that later. So handing it off to Mark now to talk a little bit about what we know about the archive we have collected so far. So one of the things that was kind of interesting about this collection is so we, we tend to get together for the um, identification, for the capturing, and we do a big um, data transfer. Um, any of the institutions can take a full copy of all of the data. Um, LC takes a copy, um, the Internet Archive takes a full copy, and UNT takes a full copy, and then we kind of wait for three years. And go about our normal lives and come back. But um, one of the things we kept getting asked was, um, well, now that you have kind of longitudinal data, you have 2008 and 2012, surely you guys, you, you've learned a lot, and you can tell us what's changed. And um, we don't really have a lot of those numbers. Um, we did a little bit of kind of exploratory research on this for a paper um, this summer at the uh, Web Archives and Digital Libraries uh, um, workshop around JCDL, and that's what a little bit of this is going to be presenting on. But um, just some of the numbers uh, of the archives, um, the 2008 is probably the set that we've actually done the most work with. There was a, a research grant that UNT got to, to look at classification of the web archive, um, and we actually got to dig a little bit into that. But um, the, uh, the full 2012 is actually quite a bit larger than the, the 2008. Um, one of the questions we get asked a lot of time is, um, who coordinates all the crawling so that you guys aren't duplicating effort? And when we say, no one really is. We kind of just do our own thing and everyone says, but you're wasting all of this effort. Um, one of the things we looked at was just PDF content that we um, had between uh, the 2008 and 2012. And so the, the big pie chart in the, the red and blue is um, the PDF content that was read is the stuff that was not present in 2012 that was present in 2008. So missing content from the archive. And then uh, the blue little slice is the amount, that the content that we found um, PDF uh, content uh, in 2012 that was there in 2008. So it's a, a pretty small set of the, the pie. And this wasn't based on the URLs, it was actually based on the content, um, content hashes of the files. So the files could have migrated to different parts of the, the federal web. And um, so there, there was actually quite a bit that, that wasn't available, just PDF content. And then when we look at um, the overlap and how much we uh, crawl, so the, the green, um, the, so the blue, the, the, the blue pie chart is the, the amount of content that is unique to the Internet Archive in the 2000, and, uh, or in, in all of the crawls. And um, it's only a small slice that's actually duplicative of other archives. And you see that with actually all of ours. So the more we crawl, the better picture we get. There's overlap, but it's the good kind of overlap. It's kind of reinforcing content that we're not, we're not getting from others. Um, 
we also got asked on when did you guys crawl? And I think this kind of gets into more um, important ideas on especially these really large um, collaborations on collection and then you actually have a researcher who wants to use this collection and they have all these questions like when did you crawl it? How did you crawl it? What did you do? And um, a lot of this we didn't really have great numbers on. But um, just this is a, a nice little uh, a graphic of the 2008 crawling process and the 2012. So 2008 was different than 2012 and you see the big green spike which was uh, content that was captured right after the inauguration. And then when we went to 2012 and there wasn't a, a new, uh, or there wasn't a change in office, we had a little bit different crawling pattern because we knew there was, it wouldn't be the same kind of volatility that we expected from the, the years with the transition. And so it, I'm sure our, our graphs will look more like the, the green with a, a quite a big spike after the inauguration. We've been doing kind of a, a slow burn um, crawl going up into it and then there'll be a spike of activity as we go. But a little bit of the breakdown, but looking between the two, so the 2008 collection and the 2012, um, they're roughly the same amount of uh, uh, top-level domains, the .coms, .govs, .mills, um, they, but there's, there's only 225 that we have in common between the two, so there's some outliers that are kind of interesting and weird. Um, when we start to look at the domain names themselves, you see that we obviously have more domain names in, in 2012, um, and that there's actually not a lot. I mean, there there is a lot, but I you would I would I always expected there'd be more overlap in the domains. Um, but uh, when you go down to subdomains, um, you get even even more, and and surprisingly not as much um, overlap. And so you really do see that these these two collections, the, as the web evolves and as the the federal government continued to continued and continues to use the web as a vehicle to communicate its goings on, um, you see kind of this just more more and more content that goes out there. Um, we looked a little bit at the biggest change, um, and some of this was planned. So one of the things that we did in 2012 was we really started to capture social media. So there are a lot more .coms, there are a lot more of the, the, the non.gov, non.mil. Um, we also said we really need to do a better job of capturing the .mil content. We, we had gotten some of it in 2008, but we really focused um, a, quite a bit more. So you'll actually see um, we captured 484 percent more um, dot com content in 2012 than we did in 2008. We actually went down in dot gov content, which is weird. Um, <laughs> and then um, we had quite a bit of a bump in uh, the amount of dot mills um, content. And then we had this, uh, the, the dot, dot ly, we had a huge jump um, in the amount of content. And we, we actually saw a lot of evidence of one of the things that happened between 2008 and 2012 was link shorteners and we hadn't really had a whole lot of evidence of that and then suddenly in the 2012 you see that all over the place. So our two largest changing um, sets are uh, .l, .ly and ME and GL and these are all um, variations on link shortening which is, was really kind of an interesting um, uh, phenomenon that, that when we look at the web and we look at the web archives we know but we don't necessarily think we're gonna see in all of this content. Um, the biggest, when we just look at the .gov and the .mil content, we see the, the biggest change we had was um, in the, the House and the Senate, uh, or sorry, not the biggest change, but like the, the, the top, the top um, sets and you can see the change over time. The biggest ones you see, we have um, OSD.mil and Navy.mil and this kind of goes along with the idea that we said we would capture more .mil and we can show that yes, we, we did improve that. Um, and then we, we um, gained quite a bit in the House and Senate because of uh, some of the different ways that we were crawling that over time as well. Some interesting things to look at are also things that existed in um, 2008 that weren't in 2000, that, that domains that just didn't exist. And, and not only just domains, but like domains that had lots of content there. And sometimes, and usually this is really well planned. Um, you, there, was, there were some initiatives that went through and have gone through to reduce kind of the, the growth of um, the domains in the federal government and reduce and make it simpler. Um, and you see some of the, the effort there, but you see um, the like geo geodata.gov got folded into some other work. Um, 
there's uh, a, a number of others, and these are the, the URLs, the number of URLs that um, were present in the 2008, that there are no traces of this domain in, anywhere in the 2012 content, um, which is kind of interesting. The other thing that happens then is content that's new. And so these are the, you know, the, the new parties to the this, to this set. And so you have a lot of the .mil content that we weren't getting. And then you have a lot of the initiatives. And you, like if you're familiar with the Obama administration, which I'm just slightly as kind of looking at this, you see some of the things like the transparency.gov and some of the initiatives that we kind of associate with that administration coming in and be, becoming more, um, more visible in the archive. And so as we go through and, and uh, look at the 2016, once we're said and done with that, we'll be able to actually start to look at this longitudinally over three different sets. Um, we wish we had you know, more, more sets in between, but you know, at least we have these four, um, four year data sets as we go forward. But um, I will turn over to Jefferson now. Hi. Uh, so, yeah, one of the things that we have been trying to do, especially because it is a longitudinal snapshot-ish, it has some organic character to the end of term collections, uh, is figure out how to support researcher access in a variety of ways. So, not just uh, computational analysis, which obviously is growing in popularity, uh, but also just insight to some of the things that Mark mentioned about, like provenance, uh, capture information, uh, and information about the crawl beyond just a replay of the web pages. So one of the projects that we did uh, started about two years ago or so uh, was work uh, in providing, uh, working with a third party, which is uh, AltaScale, which is a sort of Hadoop in the cloud service provider. Uh, the people that created Hadoop at Yahoo spun off, formed AltaScale, uh, and they do a lot of uh, support of data mining projects and, and computational infrastructures uh, for research use. Uh, and so we extracted a lot of the .gov content, including a good bit of uh, the end of term collections, uh, put 100 terabytes into their research cluster, uh, and then waited for people to show up. Uh, and the build it and they will come model, maybe not yet quite mature enough for data mining research, at least in the sort of academic social science community. Uh, but we did have uh, at least three or four users. Probably uh, the most uh, successful ones were uh, political science department at University of Washington, which does a lot of polyinformatics and is already doing data mining uh, of government content, legislative and, and digitized materials at scale. Uh, and Rutgers, which is looking at uh, the sort of uh, communications and social aspects of uh, government content and change over time. So uh, they have both published on their papers and looked at things like uh, term frequency changes over the course uh, of uh, you know, the two end of term collections, uh, how uh, government properties around specific topics uh, emerge, disappear, content changes, content drift. Um, so there are a couple of publications out there if you look for like Indeterm or .gov data mining, um, and they're, they're good examples of this. Uh, but we haven't necessarily gotten the uptake we would have expected, especially since this was a fully subsidized project. People could basically log in, use the data. Uh, all the compute was also subsidized uh, by AltaScale. So it was basically a come and use the infrastructure, and I think there's still a lot of hurdles for all of us to get over as far as providing the sort of support mechanisms, the educational uh, aspects, the training, even just like account administration uh, of using data mining platforms. Uh, so I think there's work to do there. But we've certainly seen a lot more interest and gotten a number of researcher emails already. And you know we've really only started crawling maybe a month or two ago. So I think there'll be a lot more of this type of research in the, in the future. Another way we're trying to give access to researchers is through derived data sets. So for people that don't want to deal with the 100 plus 200 terabyte collections or don't have the infrastructure to take a copy of that, uh, we will do data mining internally in our own cluster uh, and try to create data sets that can inform specific type of research. So uh, there's sort of extract certain metadata from each individual resource, like page title, uh, links, anchor text, things like that, and put it in a small, much smaller file that still contains 
uh, useful information for data mining across the whole collection, uh, but is much easier to deal with. Uh, we also do link graph files. Uh, network analysis is quite popular, so this is uh, what links to what with a timestamp, and you can, of course, track that uh, over time. And there's been a couple of efforts around this with uh, the Canadian government content, uh, which we've worked with some folks in Canada on. And there's, uh, if you go to webarchives.ca, there's a good network analysis of Canadian political parties. It's a little more political parties, not necessarily government, uh, but you see how uh, departments and agencies link to each other and then don't, and then get in fights and stop linking to each other, uh, and so forth. So graph analysis is super popular as far as web resources over time. Uh, and then we also extract uh, named entities. So uh, that's people, places, organizations, and those names. And all of these, of course, are associated with timestamps. They're associated with the URL that they came from. Um, so you can do data mining like that. And these can be delivered usually as JSON files that people can interact with. And we've also been uh, building APIs on top of them. Uh, the other, another angle of research support is sort of uh, the more hackathon community uh, oriented model. So we do uh, work a good bit with uh, Archives Unleashed, which is a, a mostly NSF funded uh, project to get researchers to use web archives more. We had an event at the Library of Congress uh, in, in March, June. Uh, and one in U University of Toronto, I guess, was March. Uh, so two last year, we'll have at least two uh, coming up in uh, next year. And a lot of these, we use the .gov data sets, not all 100 plus terabytes, but smaller portions of it, like just whitehouse.gov or, or things like that, uh, that people can work on locally at their laptops with uh, engineers and archivists and, and collection people there in the room with them. So those have been super successful. Uh, there's Web Archive CA, uh, and we've also supported similar style hackathons using .gov data uh, in Europe. So the .gov stuff is public domain, so it's very easy to give out, to give to people, uh, and gets around a lot of the issues with trying to get permissions or rights or whatever. Uh, so a lot of hackathons that are doing uh, working with web archives end up using the .gov stuff. Uh, so semi-affiliated, semi but I figure I'd mention it, uh, is a lot of this the site search capabilities that we're putting on Wayback Machine at Internet Archive, so web-beta.archive.org. Uh, and some of the things there are driven by the same desires to give information, insight, and provenance to captures, um, and that is useful for .gov. So uh, one thing here on the left is their uh, APIs around capture information uh, at a host and domain level. So for instance here, like justice.gov or whitehouse.gov, uh, you can actually hit this endpoint and look at certain MIME type, the number of MIME type captures uh, per year, as well as information like, is it a new capture? Or is it a revisit? So something we already had that hadn't changed. Um, and so that's super useful for people that are interested in looking at a domain change over time. Uh, and then there's similar visuals uh, on top of each domain. So graphs around how much content was image or how much was media. Uh, and so uh, there's a good bit of those. We've also been doing uh, extraction projects uh, for specific uh, domain level or even host or subdomain level uh, around specific type of content that people would be more interested in. Uh, so we have a PowerPoint and PDF search and it's basic faceted search. You can look by the domain, the year, uh, the MIME type, uh, and then do uh, a sort of keyword searches kind of thing, which is mostly running on anchor and meta tag and title text, so it's not necessarily full content text, but once you start mining across domain and year and content type, you can get uh, pretty good search results. Um, other extracted special collections, so this is one that we did for our 20th anniversary, uh, which was extracting every PowerPoint from the .mil web domain, so if you're interested in looking at military PowerPoints, uh, there's like 50,000 of them in this collection, um, all associated with the host that they were captured from. So you get some pretty insane graphics. So I, I, it was, it was, there's a great article about military PowerPoints. Uh, if you search for Paul Ford military PowerPoints, uh, and it's just this sort of mind boggling mix of, uh, of war, bureaucracy and, and PowerPoint culture. And I <laughs> have no idea where, where that ends up, but it ends up somewhere very weird. Um, 
So this year, uh, so for the EOT 2016, we actually had a number of new partners join. Uh, so the core partners, of course, remain. Uh, but George Washington uh, University Libraries, which is here in town, is, uh, has built the social feed manager tool. It's talked about a little bit in the last session. Um, they are using this as an API-based capture method, so they're not crawling. They're hitting like Twitter and Weibo and the, not for the government, but uh, Tumblr and a couple others uh, and doing uh, social media capture via API as part of the project. So that's super cool and exciting. Uh, Stanford University Libraries, which has a big gov government documents program, is coordinating a lot of other FDLPs and GovDoc libraries uh, to contribute to the, to the seed, the, the crowdsource seed mining method. Uh, and then the Federal Government Web Archiving Working Group has also been contributing. Um, uh, they have helped us in occasions like when the Senate blocks our crawlers, which happens quite often. They have good connections uh, to the congressional body, so they sometimes help when we encounter technical difficulties on the, uh, on the server side. Uh, so our time frame, you know, we sort of kicked off in the summer. We have been having regular calls, regular meetings, lots of outreach, uh, especially around uh, the public nomination of URLs. We've all been crawling for a good while now, uh, and the sort of time frame for the crawling is that we'll stop before the transition, the day before the transition, and start uh, the day after so that there's a little segmentation between the pre-administration change crawl and the post-administration change crawl, and it'll run a couple of months after that. So there should be uh, a good documentation of change, or at least immediate change, uh, once the uh, administration turns over. Uh, it'll take a little while for the full text search and metadata and get it into the public access portal, but all that should happen uh, sort of mid next year. Uh, and I'm excited at least to explore other research opportunities. Uh, so what have we thought about this year? Uh, expanding acquisition, I mentioned the API-based harvest. So we're using a number of different crawling mechanisms. Uh, that's not just regular link hop crawling, uh, but also browser automation, browser-based crawling, the API captures. So there's definitely a, a sort of a panoply of crawling strategies that we're doing a lot more of, which a lot of us are doing you know, in our day-to-day -day, uh, capacity anyway. We're exploring some of the things like the new search tools, new indexing tools, so we'll probably do uh, some language analysis to see what type of, uh, you know, the volume of sorry, Spanish language content on the .gov domain, uh, which is also something we're working on. Uh, we've seen a lot more community engagement around nominating seeds, but we've also had a good bit of interest from the federal government itself as well uh, for helping us out get seeds. So we've been using things like the U.S. Digital Registry API to get all the social media accounts, uh, a number of other government APIs, uh, some of which have just They've given us dumps of the content. Uh, so we've seen uh, those, you know, the seed nominations and how we discover things. And Abby mentioned that Google was interested in the project and has also helped out. Uh, we've been getting just much more stuff to crawl, uh, which is exciting. Uh, we've also seen more educational opportunities. Uh, we mentioned the Pratt class, but there's, there will be a couple of other classes at other LIS programs uh, or undergraduate programs that are going to be talking about .gov uh, and the Indeterm project and looking at you know, government change and how it's represented on the web, uh, and then researcher engagement. So I've mentioned most of these already, so I'll tie it up so that we can uh, chat a bit now. Uh, what are the, we've talked about all the positives, so what are the challenges? <laughs> uh, you know, content is complex. There's much more dynamic content on the web uh, than, there, than there was four or eight years ago. Uh, some of that is challenging to capture with, you know, the, with scalable crawling technologies. Uh, there's obviously just much more content on the web. Uh, the social media registry alone had over 10,000 registered social media accounts for government agencies, and those are just the people that bothered to register uh, with the GSA registry, which is probably not all of them, so uh, that's a pretty mind-boggling number itself. Uh, and obviously, it's a, it's a best effort what we can do with our time and, and resources and and such, so uh, there's not necessarily a high degree of QA beyond uh, the automated QA methods that a lot of us use uh, already. There's a lot more partners, so a lot more partner management <laughs> and project management work, uh, and a lot more seeds. Uh, so yeah, and uh, technical and time limitations, obviously the, the presidential change will happen regardless of our crawling strategies. 
Um, so there are some challenges. <laughs> uh, the, uh, what we have as far as seed list, uh, I think we have over about over 200,000 unique domains that we know about that are in the crawler. Uh, Google gave us a very big index dump that we haven't finished parsing yet, uh, but that's URL specific, it's not domains. So the domains are basically set up to scope in subdomains, scope in directories and all that sort of thing. Uh, so I think we'll have a very definitive uh, list. We also mine a number of search engines, the Global Wayback Historical, uh, as well as third party sites, uh, and we get donated list of uh, domain registries. So we're not lacking in seeds, I'll say that. Uh, how you can help uh, judicial branch websites. Uh, sometimes, as we've heard from a number of people around the uh, environmental and climate data sets this year, uh, we were getting a very good capture of data.gov, but there are sometimes FTP servers uh, are other directories that the crawler might not discover because they're hidden or their URL is generated in a really wanky way. Um, so if there are sort of subdirectories are very hard to find or many hops off uh, that have rich content in them, even if that content is not necessarily uh, you know, direct links, uh, those things uh, are, are very useful to identify. We've had a lot of back and forth around gov sites on non.gov. Um, and it's a judgment call with some of those, like the FRBs, Federal Reserve Banks, are not .gov, but clearly they're government entities. Uh, national parks are similar. So uh, the more nominations, the better. And we'll probably just crawl it all anyway, so we might as well nominate it. <laughs> um, so there is a nomination form. Here's the URL. You can probably Google it too. Uh, and it does allow for dedupe, so if somebody's nominated something, uh, you know, you'll know that as well as adding some metadata, so that'll be useful for when uh, this all ends up going into the portal. Um, so what's our plan? We're crawling as much as possible and we'll probably crawl even more uh, as, the, as January 20th comes up. Uh, access, uh, there are, I think, obviously there's the portal for looking at the captured pages and sites, um, but I think there's other access methods that we'll think about for this year. Uh, we do share all our data across the partners and that's uh, open for sharing with others as well. Uh, and then there's regular communication and outreach. So we did get some uh, press today. There's a, the Motherboard article and a Library Journal article. So it's been really interesting to have uh, the media entities reach out to us. I'll say one, uh, can I say one of the challenges? <laughs> One of the challenges is that some institutions may have some political sensitivities around uh, framing this project entirely as a um, hysterical res hy hysteria driven rescue job due to uh, f uh, imminent changes. So this project was predicated on the idea that uh, web content does change drastically at every presidential administration. Certainly this upcoming presidential change uh, given past statements has even more potential for volatility and immediate disappearance and politically driven ephemerality instead of just benign neglect ephemerality. Um, but sort of talking to the media about that has been, has been interesting because uh, I think it's, it's, it's a valid point but it's also one that is, informs the project but does not necessarily uh, drive the project outright. So. I think that'll be an interesting uh, point for discussion, hopefully. So that's it there. Thanks.